And we're coming into Advent, and the theme for Advent this year for us is peace on earth. Uh, We live in a space and a time when there just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of peace. And so we wanted to focus the next few weeks on peace and what it meant to, what it means to live a life of peace, um, follow uh, the way of peace lined out in the scripture. And today we are going to start this off. I think we need to start this off as we're in the Christmas season talking about peace. We need to talk about the man of peace. Start out talking about the man of peace. And so that is going to be our theme for today. Now, all of us here are peoples, right? I think all of us here are peoples. Are peoples. As peoples, things happen in our lives that disrupt our lives. Maybe broken relationships happen or, or something happens in your life that um, kind of throws you through for a, a loop. And I think we all kind of experience that from time to time. And when something happens like a broken relationship, we often don't feel like we have peace, right? Anybody been in a situation like that? I know I have. Uh, even pastors, we have struggles in our relationships sometimes, and it seems like it kind of breaks our peace. It kind of breaks our peace. Even if you try to you say, well, I'm just going to push off the relationship. I'm going to get rid of the relationship because it's just too hard. That doesn't often lead us to peace, does it? Why? Because we're just pushing something off. But What happens is our minds sort of continue to process through what has happened and kind of goes back there and goes back there. And we're always reminded about those disruptions in our lives or those broken relationships. Our our minds wander to the what if. What if they would have done this? Maybe even what if I would have done this differently? How would have things turned out differently? differently. And in cutting off relationship doesn't always bring peace. Some, we, we think that in our lives, if I just get rid of the bad thing, then I'll have peace. And that's not often the case. And that's not often, we're going to talk about that today a little bit. It's, what's kind of sad is that the church itself um, isn't it an exception to the rule um, of what we see going on in the world around us. I mean, the stats show that we as the church are becoming more and more splintered over time. And what's interesting is we're called to be this wonderfully diverse, big group, including um, many, many people from different backgrounds and, and lives and, and experiences. And this is what the church is. But oftentimes we, we try to find comfort by, by finding that, that common narrative, that common story, that common experience. And when we do that, when we strive for that, it often we get smaller and smaller. Circles get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I don't think that brings peace, true peace. We, we often try to even create the, the myth of peace around us by, by saying things like, oh, well, way back when it was like this and it was so much better, but then we were forgetting the, the, the times, the trouble we had during that time. You hear people talk about, man, if we could just go back to this as a country, and I, I think, well, what, what is that perfect place? What is that perfect time when everything was just right, and, and even for a country like ours, he's like, well, you can't really nail that down, because even when we think about, well, this was a great time, well, there was so much conflict during this time, oh, we'll go back here, so much conflict, you know, this is just, this is life. The joys and the struggles, they're all mixed in together, but we try to kind of create these myths of peace. Maybe it's coming into the holiday season, oh, that, that, that Thanksgiving a year ago was so great, but we forget about the burned turkeys (laughs) and the stuffing, you know, and all those kind of things, or your team losing or whatnot, you know, uh, our our brain actually, our brain actually tries to sort of rewire our memories to kind of cloud over the bad stuff. But trying to just get rid of something doesn't bring peace in our lives. Deep down, I would say that we all want to experience peace. We all want to experience peace. And oftentimes it comes, to, comes down to trust. Do we actually trust? Do we trust in our friendships and our relationships even when times get difficult? Do we trust that things will turn out okay even if other people are making the decisions for us? Do we trust that we can make it through life even when we seem to be lacking. 
Proverbs 13, 17 says this, unreliable messengers cause trouble, but those who can be trusted bring peace. Reliable messengers bring peace. Those we can trust bring peace. Proverbs 25, 13 goes on to say, a reliable messenger is refreshing to the one who sends him like cold water in the heat of harvest time. The message is refreshing. We want to talk about a reliable messenger of peace today. The reliable messenger of peace to kick off this Advent season. Well, according to the the Bible dictionary, definition of peace is this, a state of tranquility or wholeness, shalom. Ever heard that, that word shalom, peace? Tranquility, is the state of being tranquil, that is calm, serene, and worry-free. And that's often where our minds go when we think about peace. I just want to have a worry-free life, right? I don't don't want to see things going going wrong, going south on me. I don't want to worry about stuff. I want my bank account to be big enough so I don't have to worry about those bills coming in. I want my car to be reliable enough so I don't have to worry about driving in the snow. I want my my house to be warm enough, right? Uh, I I want my electric bill to be low enough so I can afford it this year. I want my relationships to be, to be stable and, and just like no, no real issues so that I feel like there's tranquility or peace in my home. But the next piece of, or the next part of, of this piece is wholeness. Wholeness, which is the state of forming a complete and harmonious whole, unity, the state of being unbroken or undamaged. And the biblical definition of peace is a state of tranquility and of wholeness, and of wholeness. Things being unbroken, undamaged, whole, unity, having unity. And so I would say that peace doesn't come by the absence of something. We often try to, again, we try to push away what we don't like or what's uncomfortable. Say, if I could just get rid of this, or them, or whatever, then my life would be great. (sighs) Then I'd have that sense of tranquility. I'd say that peace doesn't come by the absence of something. Peace comes through being full or whole, being holy who we are called to be. Martin Luther King Jr. says this, true peace is not the absence of conflict. And again, he lived during the civil rights movement. He was out there in the streets uh, promoting peace, uh, promoting unity in a peaceful way. And he says, true peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. There's, there's something there that's helping to create this peace. It's interesting in the Bible, the, the word for uh, um, justice and, and righteousness are, uh, they come from the same roots. They come from the same roots. Uh, justice being that um, deals with the concepts of right and wrong, especially as it relates to people, people groups, or things happening when someone committing an act against another person. We think about getting justice or providing justice for that person who's been harmed. Uh, righteousness is what is right and pleasing to God, conforming to his standards put down by God, his standards. So there's a connection between righteousness and this idea of, of justice where justice is actually performed by following God's righteousness. It's, it's God imposing righteous laws on his, creature, on his creation, and he's executing them righteously. And so there's a connection here between righteousness and justice and peace. If we look at peace being whole, having a sense of fullness, peace comes when things are put right, when they're made whole again. In the Old Testament, there's this thing called the peace offering. If you've studied the Old Testament, Leviticus, and, and the laws, there's a thing, this thing called the peace offering. It, it symbolized that you were right with God, that things were right between you and God, that you were enjoying the, the, the relationship you had with God. There was a wholeness there in that relationship. Things were right. And so a peace offering in the Old Testament is described in Leviticus 7. Um, it was a voluntary sacrifice given to God because you wanted to be in a right relationship with God. Everything, you wanted everything to be right and whole. Uh, it could be given as a free will offering 
meaning that the worshiper was giving the peace offering as a way to say thank you for God's unsought generosity. God is good. Just want to offer this up as a thank you, God, for what you have done for us. Another way is the peace offering could have been given alongside a vow. You're fulfilling a vow. Uh, Hannah is a good example for this when she's fulfilled her vow to God to bring Samuel to the temple. And she brings a a peace offering to uh, express her her peace, the the peace that she had in her heart of giving her son to God for, for his service. It's like she was saying, I have no resentment. I'm not holding anything back. I'm, I'm offering this up to God to show that our relationship, what's going on here, we are all cool with this. You would think that a time like that for Hannah would be just a heart-wrenching time, right? You're giving your only child up to uh, the temple, to, to, and you're not going to see him because he's going to be raised up in the priesthood and be fulfilling all the duties of the temple. And that'd be a time for a mom to say, oh gosh, I don't want to do this. But Hannah offers up the, the peace offering and says, I'm good with this. We even understand, I'm, I'm good with this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not holding anything back. I'm not holding anything back. Another way that the, the peace offering could be given was thanking God for a deliverance in the hour of, of need. So not only what God has given as you're, you're thinking about his generosity and what he's given to you in your life, but also recognizes that he has, he's delivered you in this hour of, of need and you're offering up this, this peace offering to recognize that and to say thank you. Well, who can we trust to bring about real peace in our lives? Who can we trust to bring about real peace in our lives. We need a trustworthy man to bring about peace, a man of peace. Because again, an unreliable messenger causes trouble, but those who can be trusted bring peace. So as I was thinking about this and thinking about Jesus as the man of of peace and what he brings to us, uh, I was thinking about all the evidence for Jesus and all of the things that he did to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. And oftentimes at Advent, we think about Jesus and fulfilling those prophecies of the Old Testament. And, and, and really, the, the, the evidence for Jesus is, is undisputed. Really, no one can stand up today and say, oh, there was no man, like, there was no man Jesus. You know, uh, historically, scientifically, everybody, the, the evidence points to, yes, Jesus was a real man who walked on the earth. And if that is the case, and we're still talking about him today, you know, we need to dive deeper into, can this man be trusted? Can Jesus be trusted as our man of peace? A lot of people make predictions, right? How many predictions have been made about maybe his second coming or, or something like that, or what's going to happen in the future? And how many of those predictions have like fallen Flat. Anybody can make a prediction. It's one thing to make a prediction. It's another thing to actually have the thing come true. And when you're listening to someone, you want to be able to trust what they have to say. This, this is no different with Jesus, right? When we listen to Jesus, we want to know that we can trust what he has to say. Is that true? Is that true? Right? You listen to your favorite podcast speakers, you listen to your favorite news, uh, news correspondents or, or your favorite leaders, you listen to them because you think you can trust them, right? And you, you, you value what they have to say because you think that you can trust them. The same thing goes for Jesus. There have been a number of, of individuals, scholars, theologians, who have looked back on the Old Testament and, and tried to count the number of prophecies or things that, that alluded to, to Jesus and the work that he would do in our lives. Um, there's one guy... Uh, Albert uh, Edersheim, he, he came up with 456 direct references to what, who Jesus was and what he would do in, in the future, their future, our past, right? Uh, there's a guy called J. Barton Payne. He came up with, he found 574 references referencing who Jesus was and what he would do, specifically prophecies uh, or types, we call them types from the Old Testament uh, pointing to Jesus. A conservative number of prophecies about Jesus and, and Jesus fulfilling these prophecies is about 300. 
Scholars would say, okay, about 300. Let's be conservative on this. Let's not go overboard. About 300 solid prophecies that Jesus fulfilled dur- during his ministry. Then as he's, we're looking for his second coming, that would go up as well. I found the, that in the, the, this article from called uh, Got Questions, gotquestions.org. Uh, they got interesting, uh, interesting research on the scriptures and about the Bible. There's another article called Empowered International. And uh, this article looked to actually scientifically and mathematically look at the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled and make some, make some uh, comparisons. What does it mean? What, what does it mean that, that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies? How likely is it that Jesus would fulfill all of these prophecies? Interesting stuff. I mean, uh, what's the likelihood that a person will predict where a future leader will be born? Okay, so we could, let's, let's think about this here. We're, we're going to make a prophecy. I want someone here to think up a leader's name in the future. Let's say just like 200 years. Think about leader's name. We're going to write it down. All right. And then you got to pick where he's going to be born. All right. Do you think we'd be able to do that? No? No? Do you think people 200 years later would look at that sheet of pants? <laughs> we got screwed up, right? Uh, there's no one by that name. No, Micah did that 700 years before Jesus was born. Go back to, to Micah. He did that 700 years before Jesus was born, picking where the Messiah would be born. What about picking, uh, what about looking at a leader, picking a leader again, picking a leader's name out of the hat? Let's go, let's go 100 years. Let's pick a, a leader's name 100 years from now. And say, and then let's predict how this person, man or woman, is going to die. Think we could do that? Think we could do that successfully? Probably not. Probably not. But David did that a thousand years before Jesus and referenced a manner of death that wasn't even invented yet. Alluded to a manner of death that wasn't even invented yet. And so in this article by uh, this Empowered International article, and man, I I had the article and I don't know where it went, so I don't have the title of the article, but I can get that, get that. But this this, uh, professor at Westmont College took up the task of calculating some of the major prophecies about Jesus, all right? He wanted to calculate the probability of these prophecies coming true. All right, and he made, um, he made estimates. Actually, he didn't just make the estimates. He had, he's a professor, so he has a lot of students. Uh, he had 600 students in 12 different classes. Okay, 600 students in 12 different classes. Their assignment uh, was uh, to, to look at prophecies about Jesus and uh, figure out the probability of them being fulfilled. And they made estimates so that they were unanimous. They made their estimates so that they were unanimous, even amongst the most skeptical students. Okay, so they, they narrowed this down from all the prophecies. They started talking, well, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? You'd have people say, no, no, I can't. I would never. I don't think that one ever happened. Or, or Jesus is, that's not a reference to Jesus. And so they narrowed down the list just so even in the, the believers and the skeptics, they were all in agreement, yes, this would be a valid study. This would be a valid study, okay? And so they studied, and they, they talked about this in their classes. Then the professor submitted the figures for review to the Committee of the American Scientific Affiliation, a group that actually looks at numbers and stats and probability, all right? And this group, they agreed that his figures were dependable. They're just trying to figure out the, you know, the probability of someone fulfilling these prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. So, for example, in their research... They looked at uh, Micah 5.2, and it states that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and the professor and his students determined the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present, and they divided it by the average population of the earth during the same time period. So they, they, they looked through research and data and all this kind of stuff to, to, make their, uh, to get their figures, and they concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem was 1 in 300,000. So... Picking a name, that person being born in this town, right? Or this, this leader being born in this town, and say one in 300,000 chance. 
All right, now they zeroed in because they were looking with, uh, with those who were probably believers and those who were also skeptics and trying to find just a good baseline where they would all agree that, hey, let's study, these are the stats. These are the stats. They zeroed in on eight prophecies of Jesus, all right? I'm not gonna go through all the details here. And they found that the chances of one man fulfilling them all was 10 to the 17th power. Eight prophecies. We go through all here. So let's conservative. We think about, oh, there's 300. We would go through and look at 300 prophecies about Jesus and him fulfilling them as the Messiah. And they said, they said, okay, according to our calculations, one man just looking at eight was 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros. I don't even know what that figure's called. You might know what that figure would be called, 10 with 17 zeros. It's almost like infinity, right? You just think about this, this is like infinity. Suppose, here's an illustration to kind of point out, you know, how, how, how oh man, and how improbable this would be. Suppose that we would take 10 to the 17th power, okay, so silver dollars, so you got a silver dollar, you take 10 times 17, zeros of those, all right? Let's say that you could lay all those silver dollars on the state of Texas. It would fill the state of Texas, even a couple feet deep, all right? So you get all these silver dollars over the state of Texas, a couple feet deep, and what you do is you go in there and you mark one of them. So put an X on one of them, throw it out there, mix them all up, mix them all up, and then you blindfold someone and say, go pick the one with the X. That's the probability of someone finding, you know, 10 to the 17th power. How is someone going to find that? How is someone going to do that? What are the chances that someone would get the right silver dollar out of that pile? And here's Jesus, our Lord, and there are more than eight different prophecies about our Lord. I think they had a number in the article what it would be if he fulfilled all like 300 of them. Someone said, someone said that you take, you take like uh, electrons and you line like 10 to the 17th power of number of electrons and it comes like to an inch and, and it would take us like 19 million years to like read that little line and, and, and pick, out the, like a, pick out one out of there that was, you know, flagged. It's just in, improbable, improbable. And what's amazing about the prophecies of Jesus are many of them are about what other people will do to him. So it's not just about someone coming up, standing up and say, okay, and let's see, how do I fulfill this? Yep, I want to do this one. Oh yeah, I got to go by this river. I got to go drink, you know, that kind of thing where you can go through and say, well, how would I do this? How would I do this? A number of the prophecies are about what other people do to Jesus, right? Like his birth, you know? Parents <laughs> had to, you know, say in that, to travel and to go and all that kind of stuff. His death, his death, you know, the time, the place, the method was done to him. The, the little things about, like the prophecy of gambling for his clothing, the soldiers gambling for his clothing at his death, death. the fact that his legs weren't broken, but the other criminal's legs were broken, it was the common practice with crucifixion. The fact that he escaped from the grave. This, this uh, college professor says this, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact, proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact of the world. And this is the Savior that we worship. This is the Savior, the Messiah, that we recognize during our Advent season. Is he not? This is the Savior that we follow. And so as we're talking about a trusted messenger brings peace, we have the most trusted messenger that has ever lived, has ever stepped foot on the face of the earth. Do we not? Amen. 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 Even, even Solomon, the, the wisest man to live, Jesus says, hey, something greater than Solomon has come. We saw that in Luke, right? We saw that in Luke a couple weeks ago. 
Any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. And so today, just for a couple minutes, and I'm hoping we're going to get some, some interaction going here, I just want to talk about three specific words spoken about, spoken about Christ through prophecy that bring us hope, that bring us comfort, that show God's righteousness, His justice, His love for all of us, proving that Jesus is the trusted messenger that we need to bring the peace that we need in this world. These specific, three specific titles that are given to Jesus found in the scriptures, found in the Old Testament, reinforced in the New Testament, and his life are prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is called our prophet, he's called our priest, and he's called our king. All three of these titles have been given to other people, but people who couldn't live them out perfectly, right? Right? People who could not live these out perfectly. You get the prophets, many prophets in the Old Testament, and then you think of someone like Jonah. Man, that's a prophet for you. All right, so they, they were human as well. Think about priests and the priests who had to offer the sacrifices at the temple, but they were human as well and would fall as well. You think about the kings. What perfect king has ever come to bring peace to this earth? And these three titles are given to Jesus of prophet, priest, and king. In Deuteronomy 18, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is Moses talking. So Moses, Moses talking to the people as the nation is being formed. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. You must listen to him. Acts 3 says this. Acts 3 says this that seasons of refreshing have come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must receive him until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. And Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to everything that he tells you, talking about Jesus as our perfect prophet. What's the, what's the job of a prophet? What's the job of a prophet? Speaks God's, speaks God's word. And the other part of that, in order to speak God's, speak God's word, you have to be able to do what? Yeah. Hear God's word. You have to, actually, the prophet has to be able to hear God's word, and then they are tr- entrusted to speak God's word. And this is who they are and what they are to do. So how does Jesus, how does Jesus as the perfect prophet bring peace to our lives? We're going to start out Advent with just a little back and forth, a little sharing time. How does Jesus, as the one who perfectly hears and then perfectly speaks as prophets, bring peace to our lives? 100% God and man, so yeah, he is the word. <laughs> yeah. How has he brought peace as prophets? To your life? Through hope? What kind of hope? Hope that someday you get to meet him face to face. Someday we'll get to meet him face to face. Yeah. He's promised. He's coming back. How has Jesus, as our prophet, given you peace? You've given us the Holy Spirit? Yep. And what did the Spirit do for us? I'm putting people on the spot here. <laughs> well, it's the Trinity. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit and Jesus are connected. <coughs> it's usually, once, when I get peace, it's usually because I've been praying and the Holy Spirit directs me to something. Mm-hmm. And Jesus promised that when he left, he would give us his spirit. And his spirit would live with those who trust in Christ as their Savior. And what does the spirit do? He guides us. He directs us. Uh, he, he intercedes for us on our behalf. 
empowers us, empowers us to actually live a righteous life. Right, other, Jesus as our perfect prophet, how does that give us peace during this season? Yeah. And love your neighbor. Right. So the prophet there. there you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I didn't want to say that because I've said that so many times in the last couple of years. Broken record. Thank you, Jens, for <laughs> mentioning that. Two laws, two things where the prophets would come down and say, This is the word of the Lord. This is what you are to do. This is how you're to repent. This is what you know, this is what's going to happen. And Jesus comes and says, Yep, this is what you're gonna do. Love God. Love God. Live your life for God. And oh, by the way, the other one that's combined with that is love one another as well. And that's how they will know that you are my followers if you do those two things. Right? I would say, as we're, as we're going to talk over the next couple of weeks, when we do that, we become agents of peace as well. And so as we move through Advent, we're going to talk about trusting in this man of peace? Do we actually trust in him? Are we actually embracing what he has to offer, what he has brought to us? If we've done that, then we can go out, we're going to talk over the next couple weeks, and we can actually be an agent of peace as well. Anybody else want to say anything about Jesus as our prophet, our perfect prophet? He also said, a perfect prophet, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world does. <clears throat> and I'm just glad that he, uh, he doesn't act the way the world does, or even a false peace. Mm-hmm. But he gives, he gives the peace. Yeah. And that's the prophet telling us. Yeah. Sometimes in the world we get messages, okay, this is how you're going to keep the peace. You you just say this to one group, and it may get us like saying two things, you know, out of both sides of our mouth. It's like, okay, I'm trying to keep the peace. I don't want to offend this person. I don't want to offend this person, and therefore my stories are all over the place because I'm just trying to juggle all these relationships, all these things that are going on. And and Jesus comes in and says, boom, here it is. Again, going back to the the laws as well. Here it is. This is what you do. This is what you do to have peace in your lives. We need one who can clearly declare the word of the Lord in our lives. This is what a prophet does. This is what Christ has done for us. And we were blessed to have the scriptures, God's holy word, to give us direction, to have the spirit to give us direction in our lives so that we can actually follow in the way of this perfect prophet. But not only do we need clarity about God's word, we also need to be in relationship with God. And we were cut off, right? If we, before we trusted in Jesus Christ, we were cut off from a relationship with God. And this is where we need a priest. Psalm 110 says, The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. And Hebrews goes on to say this, In the same way, Christ did not exalt himself to become a high priest, but God who said to him, You are my son, today I become your father, also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our perfect priest. Jesus is our perfect priest. What's the job of a priest? What's the job of a priest? We're going to interact more here. Intercession, right? Interse- between the sinner and God, right? Intercession. In the Old Testament, it was by giving, helping with those sacrifices, be, being a place and, and a time to give the sacrifices so that we could get in right relationship with God. Yep, intercede between God and man. So also, a priest's job is also to make sure that people have the tools that they need to be in the re- right relationship with God. A priest could come... And say, you know, I don't really feel like doing this temple thing today. You know, I'm going to sit off on the side and we're just going to let the altar do its thing. Or, you know, and the priest was there to provide, provide the tools and the way for people to actually be in relationship with God. And so they intercede themselves. They also provided the tools that were necessary to do that. What's interesting about uh, Melchizedek is uh, we think about the, the priests that were in um, the, the temple system, 
And they were specifically for the nation of Israel to perform the sacrifices and the duties for the nation. Melchizedek comes before that. He's during Abraham's time. He actually speaks to Abraham, gives blessing to Abraham. And the, the word is saying that Jesus, Jesus is this greater period. He's in a line of greater priests, the priests that cover the whole world, the priests that cover the whole world, not just, not just a, a little temple system for one little group of people. Well, how does Jesus as the perfect priest being, bring peace to our lives? Shepherds. Shepherds us? Shepherds us? Yeah, for, so I like the example piece of giving us his example. The priests were to be an example for the people. What else? Jesus as our perfect priest, how does that bring peace to us? Again, these are, what we're looking at are three <coughs> prophecies, three words about Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament. These three titles given to Jesus were very, very important. Jesus as our perfect priest. Sacrifice and forgiveness. The, the priests of the Old Testament, they could make sacrifice, but they would never put themselves up on the altar, right? <laughs> that was not their job to put themselves up. Jesus becomes the sacrifice. Is He's the sacrifice and the one offering the sacrifice in a perfect way on our behalf. Think about the priests. They had to do this every day, every day. The temple system had to go every single day. Sacrifices would be made. There would be holidays. Like, okay, this has to happen for the nation to be right with God. And so you'd have daily sacrifices. You have monthly sacrifices. You have yearly sacrifices that had to happen in order to be in right relationship with God. And, G- and Jesus, what does he do as our priest? He comes and says, what? What does he say on the cross? It is finished. It is finished once and for all. Sometimes, I do this, I'm sure that others do as well, we forget the it is finished part, that he has finished it on our behalf. And we kind of get wound up on, oh, am I good enough? Did I do it right? You know, we get into almost that, that temple sacrifice system of I have to do, I have to do, I have to do in order for God to accept me. We've already been accepted because of what Christ has done. Everything that that comes after that flows out of because, oh my gosh, he has freed me. He has now freed me to live. We don't have to perform to be right with God. We just have to accept Christ's perfect sacrifice that he offered once and for all. And he says those words, it is finished. In Easter, we'll go to the it is finished part, right? It is finished. The work is is complete. The, the getting right with God, that door is wide open for anybody who wants to enter in and pursue that relationship with God. It is wide open. We don't have to continue to perform and perform and perform to get right with God, to keep our standing with God. And sometimes we forget that. We think, oh man, I failed, so man, you know, God's going to kick me out. No, 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 no. Christ, as our perfect priest, has offered that perfect sacrifice once and for all for us. The last one is king. King Isaiah 9, 7 7 says this, Dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. Talking about the kingdom. He will reign on the throne of David and talking about the Messiah and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. this is talking about the promised Messiah who would come in the line of David, who would be a king over the nation. Romans 1, 3 through 4 says this, concerning the son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is a descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is the promised king that they were waiting for and a king that we need in our lives. What's the job of a king? What's the job of a king? To rule. To rule. To rule. Justice. Bring justice. We talked about God's righteousness is tied to justice and how he treats uh, this, this world and he's, he has a righteous justice. Yep. It's to 
Make sure the citizens are safe, right? Where we're secure in God's hands because of our position in Christ Jesus. It's to secure the country, the kingdom of God is growing. It will never shrink. It's growing. And it's secure because of what Christ has done for us. How has Jesus, how does Jesus as the perfect king bring peace to our lives? How does Jesus as the perfect king bring peace to our lives? Yeah, he's in control. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He's he's provided. He's in control. Talked about his laws earlier. He's given us his commands. A king gives commands. So, oh, this is what I want you to do today. Eh, this is what I want you to do today. Oh, I'm changing my mind. This is what we're going to do now as a kingdom. And you have the kingdoms of this world are going to go all over the place. Right? All over the place. I mean, we, we love this great country of ours because we have representatives who represent us, but every couple of years we vote in new ones. And what does that mean? We're going all over the place, potentially, right? Potentially. We have a king who's secure and firm and says, nope, here it is. Here it is. This is the rule. This is what it means to be in the kingdom. You follow this. What else? What else does it mean? How, how does Jesus, as our perfect king, how does he bring peace? To our lives. Protects us. Protects us? Yeah. How so? Do you have a personal story? Yeah. He gives us defense against evil. Mm-hmm. Gives us the tools we need. Again, going back to the spirit. Gives us the, the, the things that we need. Putting on the armor. Gives us the, the armor. Right? That's Jesus as king. Yeah. As king, he put his seal upon us. Yes. The Holy Spirit is his seal. Yes. Guarantee yes. Of right. You, you, get a, you get a proclamation from a king or an important notice from a king, and they seal that thing to go out to make sure that, hey, this came from this guy, and this, you're your king. He has put a, that seal upon us. Right? Well, these are three titles of Jesus the prophet, priest, and king, and they're important. They're important. And you think about what it means for, for uh, one person to come in and fulfill all the prophecies, all the things that were spoken, all the things that the promises that were spoken about in the Old Testament, looking forward to that future Messiah. And even, even just eight of them, eight of them. If, if one man did eight of those, it's 10 to the 17th power of zeros, the probability of one person doing that. You pick out a random person and you know, hey, you're going you're gonna to do this, right? <laughs> and be a random person and, and, and having someone do that for us. An unreliable messenger causes trouble. But those who can be trusted bring peace. This is what Jesus does for us. And peace comes when things are put right, when things are made right whole again. It's not about getting rid of something. It's actually about being whole. Interesting that I think the peace of Christ doesn't come through the crucifixion. That's a time of injustice, the killing of an innocent man. The peace of Christ comes at the resurrection. The fullness of God's plan had come together, and justice was served for Christ and for for sin and death, sin and death were conquered. Well, I want us to remember this season, as we get into Advent, that there is a prophet who wants to give you words of peace. There is a priest who wants to provide a path of peace, even amongst the chaos of our lives. And there is a king who wants to bring the rule of peace over your life. Have we embraced this? Have we acknowledged this? Is there, is there, I'll say, a piece of this that we've forgotten? Is there a part of who Jesus is that we've sort of forgotten or, or let it kind of go by the wayside in our life and we need to kind of re-embrace that so that we can be fully whole again? Jesus is that man. 
And as we come into this Advent season, we remember with confidence why he is our perfect prophet, priest, and king. And we can look back and be filled with peace because Jesus is the great bringer of peace that we so desperately need. And as we're in Advent, we don't just look back at his birth, but we also look forward and toward his second coming, knowing that he will fully bring the peace that this world so desperately needs. Jesus is the one, he's the only one, who can make us whole again. And that's our focus of this Advent season. We're going to take communion today. It, it, appropriate, kicking off Advent, that we remember what Christ has done for us, the, the price that was paid on our behalf so that we could enter into God's family. We could be part of God's kingdom, falling under the, the rule of this righteous king. And Isaiah 53 says this, he was pierced because of our rebellion That's serious stuff. He was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace. Punishment for, there's that word again. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. Do you recognize that Jesus today? Do you recognize what Christ has done for you? You can open up your Elements will take in just a second. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, very familiar passage. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord took bread, and take the bread here, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is in remembrance for you. Do this in, or which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Let's just take a second to reflect on what Christ's sacrifice, his, his, his broken body, what it means for us. Jesus, we are so grateful that you took it upon yourself to go to the cross, to have the weight of our sin, to have the weight of death be placed on your shoulders so that we would not have to feel that penalty. We would not have to deal with those consequences. Lord, we are thankful. We are grateful this morning. We're also sad as we reflect back and we know that our sin caused your body to be broken. But Lord, we know that you are our great Savior. You are a great King. And we thank you for that, your sacrifice. Let's take this bread in remembrance of Christ's body broken for us. It says... In the same way, he also took the cup, and after supper, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take a second to reflect on Christ's sacred blood that was shed on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for the perfect blood sacrifice that you offered up on our behalf. We could not do this on our own. We needed a perfect sacrifice, and you provided that. We thank you, Lord, that because of your blood, the the sins in our life have been washed away. They no longer determine our relationship with God, but through the sacrifice, Lord, you've opened up a way for us to be in communion and full fellowship with God. And we praise you for that. Pray, Lord, that our lives would be a reflection of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. That we would live in a way to to follow your example and walk in righteousness and truth following our great Savior. 
We come in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's take the, the blood in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. This marks the church. This marks who we are and what we do. In Acts, it says, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, every day, because of what the early church did, because of how they lived and how they they looked towards the future, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Praise be to God. We're going to spend some time in worship now. And as I pray, the worship team can come on up. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for who you are. As we come into Advent, Lord, let us not forget the the fullness of your life. We come in and we remember your birth, but it did not stop there. Lord, you walked on this earth. You grew and you walked and you gave us an example of what it means to to live out uh, the kingdom life. You told us how to live as our king. You gave us the word of the Lord as our prophet. And you gave us the perfect sacrifice that we needed to be in relationship with God as our priest. So we thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done for us. And we come now praising your name. Amen.